You have now arrived at your destination. Mac, this is such a joy to do. I've wanted to do this for a long time, having been a bit of a fan of your Twitter for a long time. So huge pleasure. And thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me here, man. This is like a crazy moment for me to actually be on the 20 Minute VC show. Like, it's truly an honor. Well, I mean, listen, it is great to have you here, but I want to start with a little bit of context because, um, you know, you've heard the show many times that, oh, I serendipitously fell into venture from being at Harvard Business School and Google, and it was just so surprising to me. It's not your background, so tell me, how did you make your way into venture, and what was that entry point for you? Yeah, it's it's weird. Like, so, so like I'm, I was a software engineer, and I was a government contractor for years. I then went on to be a two-time founder. But my second company wasn't a success, it was a failure. And so I had ended up working at a marketing firm for a year. And that firm ended up getting a client I didn't agree with ethically. And so I quit. But when I quit, I didn't have any plans. And so I quit on a Friday. And the very next Monday, I get this email saying the investment arm for the state of Maryland's hiring. I'm like, okay, I don't have a college degree. I don't have a finance background, but I know startups. And I know a lot of people in Baltimore. Let's go ahead and try this. And four and a half months later, they hired me. That's how I, I broke in. I, I I love that. Can I ask one thing? Which is like, you know, I I've failed many times. You know, I failed to get jobs when I was uh, early. I got rejected by many venture firms, which not many people know. But we're going to have an open conversation today, so this is going to be a fun one. When you failed with the startup, how did you manage that? And how did you deal with that person? It's such a tough time. Um, I didn't deal with it well, right? Um, I basically. Got burnt out, told my investors, hey, thanks, but no thanks. Um, here's what little money we have left. You can all have it back. And I basically hid in my house for six months because I didn't want to see anybody or talk to anybody. Um, and I was basically depressed because to fail in such a public way, when you got all these people and supporters around you, everybody's telling you how great you are, how smart you are, how you're going to be the next this, the next that. And then it doesn't work out. It felt terrible. Like... I spent all this time networking and being around people to like not wanting to see anybody because I didn't ever have, I didn't want to have to explain what happened. I didn't want to have anybody ask me like, "How's your startup doing?" And maybe fake about it and did the smile and be like, "Ah, oh, we're doing okay." And so um, I was I was just stuck in my house. And then something incredible happened. I recognized that the people who truly cared about me and loved me didn't care. Whether or not I succeeded in that startup didn't change the way they thought about me or change how smart they thought I was or how much they respected me. Like, love and, and respect from your friends and your family members can truly be unconditional. And so when I looked up and everybody's like, yeah, you, so what? Like, you've done all these other amazing things. You had one thing that didn't work out. Oh, boo -hoo. Like, it's okay. You have a great skill set. If you need to, you can always get a job. Are you coming over for the holiday dinner? Because, like, we, everybody wants to see you. It's like... But I failed and I lost these people's money and, you know, I thought all these things were going to happen and nothing happened right. And everybody's like, OK, so do something else. But let's go get grab a drink, go to a bar and watch a game like we miss you. And that helped me move forward and recognize, like, whether or not I succeeded in a startup or adventure or anything didn't dictate how the people around me felt about me. And so that was really liberating. I, I spoke to a couple of your founders before the show, and they said that, you know, when it comes to the conversations they can have with you, um, they're a lot more real and honest than they are with other members of their cap table. What do you think it is that basically allows you to have that relationship of depth and intimacy with founders that maybe other investors don't have? I mean, the fact that I'm a former founder helps, but I think it's more just I'm OK having any and every conversation with them because we're people. Right. Like I'm a people person. I'm somebody that people can talk to and I'm, I want to be a true supporter because like I remember as a founder, just like how hard it was, how lonely it could be. Like, yeah, I had a team, but as a CEO, I'm still lonely. Right. Like the arguments me and my teams would get into after pitch competitions because I didn't talk enough about their background and then point them out enough. Like, you know, I remember these arguments and these issues and like just how hard it was and then also like when i got started like i was like a 24 year old black guy in baltimore who was an engineer who didn't know anything like i didn't know what startups were i didn't know what vcs were i didn't know what networking was right 
Like, like the first time somebody told me I was networking, I thought they thought I thought they were talking about me running wires, right? <laughs> like I was so confused, and it's a really vulnerable place when you're in an ecosystem like this and you don't know. And so, for my founders, I, I want them to feel like they have somebody they can come to, and they can come to me for anything, right? Because we're all just human. Right. So just the same way, like a good friend of mine is going to call me and tell me how, you know, him and his wife just had an argument. One of my founders can call and pick me, pick up the phone and call me and be like, yeah, you know, I'm having a hard time trying to juggle it all. And we can have a conversation about it. Um, I don't know. That's just who I am. No, I totally get you. A friend of mine always tells me everyone is fighting a battle you know nothing about. And I always think back to that. I do want to ask, though, so, you know, you obviously go into the investment world and then you decide, you know, I'm going to do rare breed. Talk to me about the decisions to do rare breed. And what was the thing behind raising a fund on Twitter, Mac? I mean, this is not <laughs> conventional fundraising. So I think there's one thing for, for, for context. There's one thing I should point out is that my career and venture has been sparked by the, the killings of two black men here in America, right? So when I mentioned that I quit the marketing firm, it was because uh, Philando Castile, which was a, a black man here in America, who was driving around with a legal firearm and told a police officer beforehand that he had a firearm in his car, was shot and killed by that police officer. And that was the same week that my organization started soliciting the National Rifle Association for a contract, which has a history of not supporting black gun owners. And that's my I quit my job and end up seeing that email where I apply for the investment arm state of Maryland and breaking the venture, right? Fast forward, and that was in 2016. Fast forward to 2020, I had been thinking about, you know, a structure of a fund and wanting to start my own fund for like a year and a half, almost two years. And then George, the killing of George Floyd happens. And that was around the same time I started tweeting more and like the Twitter thing started happening. And I had met a founder in Dallas, Texas, a, a gentleman by the name of Roberto who runs a company called a Robo Amp, doing some really incredible things, but nobody wanted to support him because he was a Latin guy in Texas. And so I decided like, okay, like I'm going to put an SPV together and I'm going to invest in this one guy and I'm going to support him because I couldn't do anything else. I was a state employee. And as I started putting the SPV, one of my mentors um, somebody I respect immensely said, hey, man, I don't want to invest in this company. I want to invest in every company you ever find. So here's 250000 Go raise a fund. I'm like, I don't I don't want to raise a fund. It's a pandemic. Things are crazy. You know, life is wild. And he's like, no, you should do that. And there's a moment in time where people are looking for managers like you. And I was like, great. And so then I was like, I'm going to raise this fund. <laughs> And I started going through my network, and I got the 400K, and I was like, well, 400K is a far cry from 10 million. What do I do? Well, I didn't know what to do, but at the time, I started tweeting consistently, and I noticed other VCs were following me. And so I was like, okay, whenever I see a VC follow me on Twitter, I'm going to send them a DM and ask them for a meeting because I need to learn how to raise a fund. And as I started doing that, more like as I was doing that more and more, I started having these conversations where these other GPs would be like, well, I really like your strategy. I like the way you're thinking about what's your minimum. And I wasn't prepared for that. I'm like, well, my minimum is 10K and, you know, really, would, you know, trying to meet some folks like this conversation is not about that. But, you know, if you know anybody who'd be interested and one of the first people to say they would be interested, I don't think she knows this, is Elizabeth Yen from Hustle Fund. And that gave me the spark of like, oh, GPs will back other GPs. Mm -hmm. I can do this. And so I just doubled down the strategy of staying on Twitter. And so uh, I've told the story before, but between June, the middle of June 2020 to September 2020, I had over 1,100 meetings, which allowed me to soft circle my first 2 million and kind of gave me the confidence to quit my job and really go do this thing. I mean, I absolutely love that. There's a couple of points I have to unpack there. On the DM strategy, I love it. How many responded and how many didn't? Like, what was the ratio? And were there certain people who went out of their way to really help? It was like 70, 75 percent. Because at the end of the day, in the world of venture, we're all happy to meet each other because everybody's looking for deal flow, right? So if you see a name, Mac the VC, you assume I'm an investor, so you'll try to take that meeting. Um, so that worked out. People who reached out, uh, you know, like Elizabeth was really helpful. Niv from Shrug Capital was really helpful. Marlon Nichols from Mac Ventures, 
He's like a mentor of mine. That that dude has been great. Like I've known him for years. Um, Low Tony at Plexo has been amazing. Um, Hunter Walk early on, you know, really helps. Um, Can Jason I see- from Saster. He was the first guy who like really looked at my deck and beat it up and was honest with me about it. Like, I don't know if he understands like how impactful that was in my journey. But a lot of people helped. Do you think the traditional fundraising process is fucked up? Are you raising a fund so successfully on Twitter? Do you think it's like, fuck, why do we do it the way we do? 100%. But that's how I feel about half the stuff in venture. Like, one of the things that happened for me as I was raising my fund was... I, I had this career and I had learned all this stuff. I had gone through these trainings. I've read these books. And it was like, venture's done in this like specific way. And like, this is all the rules. And then I started raising my fund. I was like, I don't care about any of these rules. Like, fuck the rules. Like, these are all just legal structures. They can be changed. So like most people, they close. They say, you should have like 30 or 40% of your fund uh, close for your first close. My first close was at 10%. Right? People like, you know, you should only have this many closes. No, I do a rolling close every three weeks. Like, I bring my LPs in batches. Like, I want to access the capital so I can start deploying. Because I need, I wanted to build up some momentum. You know, um, you need to do traditional capital calls because you don't want to mess up your IRR. No, I gave my LPs three options. You can do 100% up front, 50% each year over two years, or 33%. Over each year over three years, with the minimum being 10K per year. So if you gave me a 10K check, you gave it 100% up front. And it's like, I'm just going to hold the money in escrow and get it when I need, because I'm not chasing anybody down for 10K checks. Um, and that was actually inspired from the way 500 startups did their fund one, where there's 50% up front and 25% each year over the next two years. And so, like, as I was building the structure and putting it together, I was like, I don't care about any of these rules. Like at all, I'm going to do what I think is best for me to manage this fund as somebody who was a broke VC, right? Like when I started raising the fund, most people don't know this. I'm broke. Like I'm sitting at home just raising the fund. How did you afford legal fees? Because this is the other thing that frustrates me. It's like one is legal fees are expensive. And two, GP commits. Like, I mean, it's a it's a lot of money. So remember when I said fuck the rules. So I have no GP commit. I didn't have the money for it. I wasn't even an accredited investor when I started raising my fund, right? Legal, I actually, this is, remember now, like I'm getting popular on Twitter, I'm tweeting a lot. My lawyer actually found me on Twitter and chased me down, said, what I got to do to be your lawyer? He's never charged me. He's been my lawyer for over a year. He's never sent me a bill. I'm like, yo, hey, Jason, I love you, brother, like. You can send me a bill down. Like, we raised some of this money. I could pay you. He's like, no, 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 no. We'll get to it one day. I was like, all right. So, like, it's just all kind of fell, fell, fell together for me. Man, I, I love that. Carlos, you said that like, one of many things seemed to fucked up. What else do you think is fucked up in venture? It's this, it's this idea, like, if you talk to a lot of older school VCs, they tell you, especially as an emerging manager, like, you need to become friends with folks at Sequoia or First Round and see if they'll let you onto these cap tables. And I'm like... So you mean to tell me the only way I'm ever going to be able to do a good deal is if I'm friends with these top tier funds because only the top tier funds see good deals. So that means you mean to tell me fundamentally, if I don't work in a big fund, I don't have the ability to get into or find a good deal. And really, but they're not talking about good deals. They're talking about hot deals. I don't give a fuck about a hot deal. Hot deals don't mean anything. The deals that matter are deals that return capital. And every high deal we know doesn't return capital. So why are you telling me to use a mediocre uh, strategy? This doesn't make sense to me. You're trying to tell me I don't have the ability to pick a good company? I'm a pre-seed investor. I give companies their first checks. So I got to be good at this. Like, if you can't see that already and this is the advice you're giving me, then you don't understand what I'm doing. And I just think that's so stupid. Do you, know, do you know what it's predicated on, though? It's predicated on future fundraising. Because if you get into the super hot company with Sequoia or First Round, you go to your LPs and you say, hey, I got into these five super hot rounds. Look at me. I can get into the best. And it's so but, long for it to work out or not that no one knows. But the, how stupid is that the LPs actually think that means anything? Like, a hot deal does not mean a good deal. Right? Why does it matter who was the follow-on investor? Right? If, if some no-name private equity firm ends up leading a series E somewhere, does a SPAC, and my company exits, 
Is that not as good as somebody as a company that got Sequoia money and exit? No. At the end of the day, we're just here about returns. So why are you qualifying my returns based on somebody else's previous success? Stupid. I'm listen, sorry. I, I, I totally, I listen, I, I'm totally with you on the hot deals not always being good deals. What else is fucked up? I'm too interested, man. This is great. I mean, we talk about diversity in venture, right? And everybody saw after the killing of George Floyd, there was all this conversation around, you know, we're going to invest in minority founders, we're going to invest in black founders, we're going to invest in black GPs. All this stuff came out. But I always tell people, when you go back to that time period, you look at it, pay attention who didn't say anything. Institutional LPs. Name one pension fund that said anything. The first people to say something was really Yale, like five, six months later. And even then, nobody else said anything because they don't have to say anything because nobody knows who they are. So if you're going to talk to me about diversity, let's talk about the top of the food chain in this industry. They didn't say anything. I don't know how much they actually care about diversity. I know what they do care about. They care about good returns. And so that's what I'll focus on. And if it just so happens that 77% of my portfolio are underrepresented founders, it just happened that way. At the end of the day, I'm a unicorn hunter, so I'm looking for returns all day, every day. But if you want to talk to me about diversity, let's start at the top. So what, what needs to change is the investment committees and the decision makers at institutions like pension funds, like corporates. A lot of that stuff needs to change. And then also we need more. There needs to be more allocators along the asset class, right? Because when you think about it, if you're if you're going to raise a fund. And you're a first time GP, you're raising, say, a $10 million fund. Those institutional LPs can't even write a check small enough to invest in your fund, right? And so even if a large institution comes out and says they want to be about diversity, well, most of us diverse emerging managers are raising micro funds and they can't write checks that small. So it's like, what can you do to support us? You probably should have a division of a fund to fund divisions just for emerging managers that write smaller checks. You can write, like if you're an LP and you don't have the ability to write a one, some, somewhere between like a one to $5 million check, eh, you might miss out on some things, right? Like you're just hoping that when I get the fund three or fund four, if I'm doing really well, that you'll get a chance to get allocation or you're going to have some consultant who's going to meet me at a conference who's going to then tell you that I'm great and that's how I'm going to get in front of you. Like I get it, right? Like the deal flows crazy on the LP side, just like it is on our side, but there needs to be more creativity around how we get money to emerge and match. And look at folks like Insight Partners or um, Alpaca VC or Plexo Capital where they're making, like, they're doing these type of checks. And because of what happened with George Floyd, you know, Insight and Alpaca did these diversity initiatives where me and some of my peers got funding at stages where we normally wouldn't be talking to folks like that. Mm. And that's made a big difference. And that's great for us emerging diverse GPs But why don't we just have that ecosystem overall for all emerging GPs, right? Like, I think it's a smart strategy. Do you know one thing that frustrates me is that, hey, we're embracing diversity in every way, gender, ethnic, educational, whatever. And then a VC firm adds two associates that are ethnically diverse, socially, whatever, in some diverse manner. It's like two associates. And then there's like five white guys who are all the GPs. And as a white guy, I'm totally laughing at myself here saying this. But like, it, that pisses me off. It's annoying. But I think the bigger thing is don't do diversity for diversity's sake. I know several diverse individuals who got those associate roles who aren't being valued at their firms. Like, trust me, I get as an associate, that job can suck sometimes. It's, it can be thankless. You're doing a lot of work. You're not investing in stuff that you always like because your job is to get stuff to the partnership, not really just because you like it. But I've seen some folks have to go through hoops and do extra work and go above and beyond what their counterparts have to do because people are making the argument that they're new to venture. But you hired them because you thought they were qualified. They've been there for over a year. You haven't done a single deal of theirs. I, in one case, I had one of these associates. They've sourced three deals from me. I've had another one source two. And I know they're good deals. Follow-up funding showing they're good deals. So why don't their firms appreciate the deals they're bringing them? Like, you got to question something when things like that happen. 
I, I, I totally get you. Can I ask, man, but Rare Breed, Rare Breed 1, what does that, you know, you, you've listened to the show, you know I love kind of portfolio construction. What does that look like for you? You've got 10 million for the fund. Mm-hmm. How do you want to allocate this? How diverse in terms of, you know, concentration? How do you think about check size? What yeah. Do do this? So checks are 250 to 100. Really, the strategy was really doing just 250K checks because really my strategy is around doing larger checks that precede. And when people ask me about ownership, I tell them it's not so much about ownership as it is about multiples. What we know is you get the highest multiples at pre C to C, and then every round after that, the multiples go down. So you need to put larger dollar amounts to get higher returns. So really what we're trying to do is put in the largest check reasonable as early as possible so that we have the potential to get a large enough return to return the fund every in every investment we do. Yeah. Um, and so really we're going to do somewhere between like 40 to 45 companies um, and, you know, we're going to probably, you know, I'm trying to be the next lowercase, so we'll see how those returns come out. <laughs> and so, so 40 to 45 with no reserve strategy. No, no. So we're going to do, so we're going to do somewhere in the neighborhood of like six to 10 follow on, Yeah. but mostly most first checks. And we'll also do a, a few off thesis investments. You know, we got about 5% of the fund allocated for off thesis. And I'll tell you, it's funny. I, I have a pre-seed fund. I invest super early. Well, it just so happens that we got to be a, a small check in the second round of Main Street. For those who don't know, Main Street second round was a $60 million round. I got to put a 100 k check on that round. Do you not know that is the deal that gets most LPs excited? <laughs> like, it's not even my strategy. It's just the fact that, for me, it's all about quality of deals. And so if it's a quality of deal... I need to take a look at it. And Main Street was an amazingly good quality deal. Uh, so, yeah, the strategy is some off thesis things for like really opportunistic quality investments, but mostly it's companies outside major tech hubs, outside of Silicon Valley, New York, and Massachusetts, North America, South America, and the UK. For these founders that are just typically overlooked, and sometimes founders that aren't overlooked, but just building great companies. Like for me, people ask me sometimes, what makes, you, what makes Rare Breed different and unique? That's like, we invest in everybody. Like, the idea that I could say that's even incredible as a differentiator, but, like, I invest in everybody. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to me, right? One of my top performing companies right now is, is a company based out of Memphis, Tennessee called BeautyByMe.io with a founder who changes his nail color three times a day and go plays basketball after work every day. And he's incredible. Charles is incredible. The company he's building might, it's going to truly revolutionize the beauty industry in ways that I don't even think he understands. And he's just in Memphis, Tennessee trying to figure it out. I, I, I love that. I do have to ask, you know, when you had Rare Breed in your mind and you were mm-hmm. thinking about what it would be like, what are the biggest challenges and what have been the biggest surprises? The biggest challenge was getting over my own, getting over my feelings of being inadequate, right? Again, like, I don't have a college degree. I don't have a finance background. You know, I got into this in a really inconventional way. And so for a long time, I was concerned about whether or not I could do this or if people were going to respect me or if people were going to care about my firm and I could get follow-on funding for my companies. And that was just me inside my own head. The other thing that was a challenge was, like, finding LPs. Like, I didn't have a network of LPs. So, like, thank you, Twitter, and thank you, 506C. Like, if not for 506C and my ability to publicly solicit, like, I don't know if this happens. And I think the last thing was I mentioned being a broke VC. I figured that if you gave me 24 months and I could talk to enough people, I could figure out a way to raise $10 million. Like, I'd f- give me enough time, I figured it out. But one of the issues that held me back early on was I didn't have the money to do the traveling to raise a fund. Like, the, like you know, COVID being what it was and everybody being stuck in the house actually helped me because I had all my meetings over Zoom. I didn't have any in-person meetings, so I didn't have to travel. So I got to save that money. If it wasn't for that, I actually wouldn't have had the money just to go to like meetings in New York every other week or fly across the country to go meet with like I didn't have that. And so that was that was I got lucky for that. Can I, can I ask on the feelings of inadequacy side? I, I've had a team. I, I have no idea how to figure out a spreadsheet. I mean, Jesus, whenever I open Excel, it says sign in or register, and I'm like, ooh, don't like this. Um, but my question to you is, what helped you get over that? Was it the Twitter accreditation? Was it the support from GPs? What allowed you to break that barrier? It was, it was, it was, it was a little bit of all that. You know, the Twitter thing was very reassuring. 
meeting with other GPs and, you know, talking, shopping, realizing, like, I can go toe-to-toe with everybody here. But I also think um, in, in August 2019, I went through uh, 500 Startups uh, VC Unlocked program based in Stanford. And it's basically, you know, for two weeks, you and a bunch of peers are learning from these Stanford professors about venture. And while I was there, I recognized very early on, like, I knew most of this stuff. You know, I... I I could do all of this. I'm having conversations with these professors far beyond what we're doing in the class. And, you know, one of the professors, Trevor, pulled me to the side one day. He's like, man, you can do this. He's like, you know, you're as good. You can do this as well as I can. You know all this material. He's like, if you want to raise a fund, I don't understand why you haven't already. And that, that validation in those moments was so impactful. Right. Having somebody who I look up to and respect and it's already been in venture for years being like, yeah, you can do this. Like, you know this. Like, And being in these classrooms and like, oh, yeah, I understand all these concepts. It, it reminded me of the time I actually went back to school. Like there was a time I went back to school and I went to Strayer University, you know, online college. And I took a database administration course. And I was like, everybody in the class is like, I'm, I'm taking this class because one day I want to be a DBA. And they got to me I was like, I'm a DBA trying to finish school. And I'm just sitting in the class like, I could have taught this class. Yeah, I'm not doing this college thing again. Like, not, so it's just not never happening. It was just like the same kind of moment again. And so that was really helpful. And yeah, that's how I got over it. Can I ask you one? And it's, it's something that I actually struggle with a little bit, honestly, which is like, you know, again, imposter syndrome to, you know, being more successful, you know, as, as you are now. Um it kind of got to my head a little bit, actually, when I was probably t- three years in, maybe. Um, do, you, do you ever worry that kind of you can kind of believe the hype and actually this grit that you have in the early days and that I'm going to make this work and it's just hell, fire, whatever it is, nothing's going to stop me. You can almost become a little bit lethargic with success. Yeah, but I think I've had enough failures in my life to know I need to stay grounded. Like, even now... My portfolio's doing well. You know, we've gotten several early markups. And everybody's like, oh, this is amazing. This fund's going to be great. And I'm like, eh. Until we get returns, none of this matters. Yeah. Right? Like, this all looks good on paper. But, like, what matters is returns. And so it could look good today. It could look good for the next three years. And it could all bottom out after that. And keeping that perspective and always reminding, you know, my, my team and the folks helping me helps me stay level because, it is easy to get caught up in the hype. You know, um, when I was working for the investment arm for the state of Maryland, you know, we started this pre-seed fund for underrepresented founders and they got all this hype and everybody's excited. And like, oh, you're doing these amazing things. The first three companies we invested in went straight to zero. <laughs> like my first three, straight to zero. The next six, all still alive today. Three of them are in my current portfolio, Right. But that was a humbling experience. I'm like, oh, we could do this. We know what we're doing. We're going to chase the game. We're going to do this amazing thing. First three zeros right off the bat, right? Like you can't start off any worse than that. Like you can only go up from there. I mean, to be fair, I think your first check is always going to be a bad one. <laughs> I mean, uh, I know mine fucking was. <laughs> um, but I, I, do, I do want to ask you, I said about the challenge there. What about the biggest surprise? The biggest surprise has been Twitter. Like, I've been on Twitter since 2010. Last June, I had 2,500 followers, right? Like, 10 years. 2,500 people. I went from 2,500, I think I just crossed 50,000, like, yesterday. And it's been surreal. Um, Having done the Twitter thing and, and interacted with so many folks over a short amount of time, I would have folks I'd be meeting with telling me how all these people in their firm are talking about me. I'm like... But you work at like a top tier firm. How do they even know who I am? Why do people care what I have to say? I've, I've gotten on calls and like I've had people like burst into tears because they're meeting me. You probably have. You probably had some of this before. It's like I'm just another emerging manager trying to do good work. Like I ain't special. I ain't a celebrity. Nothing like that. That's been kind of. And then you know because of that, I've now gotten to have a podcast with Inside, and I've had like. Four or five different people reach out to me about doing TV shows. It's just like, just because I got people to listen to me on Twitter, like my whole life is changing. That was like a crazy surprise. 
I mean, it's a lovely surprise, and no, I, I have to admit, I, I do like it when you get a selfie request on a date, and you're like, huh, this happens all the time, don't worry. I'm just famous to a small group of nerds in finance. Exactly. <laughs> uh, it's hilarious. I, I do want to ask, you know, we spoke about rare breed and the, the structure and the strategy. A lot of people are talking about rolling funds. Like, how do you feel about the rise of rolling funds, and why did you decide not to do a rolling fund? I think rolling funds are another sign of the lack of innovation in our industry, right? Like Angel's List took something that had been around before that people weren't really using. They took a designation of 5016, which had been around since 2013, that nobody was really using and kind of pushed it together and made a product to help emerging manager or give another structure for fundraising. And it's like, everybody's like, oh my God, this is so world changing. It's like... Well, should we be doing stuff like this on the regular? Should we be thinking about how to come up with stuff like this often? Like, if this is the biggest innovation we can point to, that's sad, right? But then the other thing for me was I, I looked at rolling funds. I thought they were really interesting. They allowed, they would allow me to take advantage of, like, my, my growing Twitter following and such. But what I didn't like about rolling funds was the way they do LP returns. Like, LPs have to continuously buy in the quarters to make sure – they get allocation to the companies you invest in. So if you're not an LP in the specific quarter, and that's the quarter I make my best investment in, but you're an LP in the quarter before or the quarter after, you don't get access to that deal or to those returns. And I knew for me that a lot of my earliest LPs were just going to be people who truly supported me and cared about me. And some of them were going to be writing small checks. So if you write me a small 10K check and you can only spread that across four quarters, then that means if I make a really good investment in quarter five or beyond, you don't get access to that. But in a traditional fund, you get access to every deal I do over the life of that fund. I needed to make sure I was going to be equitable to all my LPs. And I couldn't put them on the, on the wheel of like, well, you gave me 10K for these first four quarters. If you want to get into the next deal, you got to put up another 10K. Like, I didn't want to do that to folks. And, but I did still want all the advantages. And so I created a fund, this traditional fund. We use 506C so I could publicly solicit. Um, we work with Carter as our back end. And so uh, Carter um, told us they were partnering with a company called Anduin Transactions, which turns your sub docs into a guided web form. And so we made a website that had a button that says, click here to become an LP. And if you do and tell me you're accredited, you get access to my sub docs. It's that easy. Go to our website, click a button, you get to our sub docs. You can sign up to be an LP right away. Uh, I've had. I've had quite a few LPs sign up to be LPs without ever talking to me. And so I have to like double back and talk to them after the fact. And then I told Carter, I was like, look, I want access to the capital kind of like how rolling funds do. They give you that first quarter as you go. I was like, I'm going to do a rolling close every three weeks. So as our LPs come in, I just want you to close on them. I actually wanted to do it every week. And they were like, can you give us a better cadence like every three weeks? I was like, sure, we can do that. And so very quite quickly, I had a traditional fund that gave me all the advantages of a rolling fund without any of the disadvantages because all the disadvantages were structural all the advantages were all like technological so it's just ran with it well, we spoke about the kind of structural lessons there how you did that love that actually and uh, i'm totally with you i think the biggest mistake people make is they don't take lp cash off the table and they leave it for too long and then people forget about it and it's like ah, i actually allocated it elsewhere and you know you loosen them you know you've had a lot from the challenges to the surprises to the lessons on the structure when you think about advising managers today what do you know now that you wish you'd known when you were at maryland when you were starting rare breed in the first day What's the, oh, I wish I had known this when I started. Fundraising is going to be one of the hardest things you ever have to do. Everybody's going to tell you that, and it's going to be harder than that. So just know that going in. Understand that all the strategies and advice you're getting, it's all great. But you don't have to follow any of it. You don't have to do any of it. You can create your own structures. Like the same way I decided I was going to change the way I was going to do my fundraising and my structure, you could do the same thing. You don't have to follow these traditional rules that everybody says we have to do. You can be innovative. You can be innovative with your fund. You can be innovative with your structure. I mean, you can look at somebody like Will Zell from Zell Capital. He created an access fund. He worked with the SEC to create a fund where you could publicly solicit and you could take as many LPs as you want, like from anybody, including retail investors. I mean, that's innovative. Like, well, Will's doing some crazy stuff. Like, you can put in the work to kind of structure a fund the way you want it to be. You don't have to follow all these antiquated notions of, and advice that you get. Um, so be bold. 
Be very bold. Be very bold. What do you want to build with Rare Breed? Like, if we do this show in 10 years' time, what is Rare Breed? So I love this question because I'm going to build the next NEA, the next Spring Spring Associates, the next top-tier firm. And I use those two firms very specifically because what I don't think many people recognize is both of those are Baltimore-based firms. Two of the three founders of NEA are from Baltimore. They used to have originally NEA is a Maryland-based firm. One of the founders of Greenspring is the son of one of the founders of NEA. And those are people who are my mentors, my advisors, the folks who will help me in my career. And so I am built on the shoulder of giants. And so you're going to look up 10 years from now and we're going to be building the next top tier multi-stage firm based out of Baltimore. And that's what it's going to be. Final one for the quick fine. It's like every firm says, you know, um, what is it? Um, you know, entrepreneurship is unevenly distributed and amazing people come from anywhere and all of this. Do you find that's the case when you look at follow on funding and you give it to your top tier series A's, B's, C's? Do you find that actually they are fully embracing Maryland, Texas, you name your, I don't know America very well. <laughs> you name your place that's okay. Middle America. Or are they like, ah, it's not in New York or not for us. They care about money. So if you have strong enough metrics, they find a way to get over themselves, no matter where you're from. And that's all. And that's why I tell my founders, like, hey, there may be biases against you. People may say, if you don't live close enough to us, or if you're not in New York or Silicon Valley, you can't find top tier talent. But if you're growing by 40% month over month and you got strong margins and the business looks like it's unstoppable, you'll get a check from somebody somewhere. So if you focus on that, everything will be all right. And that way, I don't have to think about what the Series A folks are doing. As long as I help my companies be as strong and grow as fast as they can, it'll happen. Yeah, I'd, t- I'd take 40% month on month. That'd work, work for me. Thanks, Mac. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, uh, I do want to move into my favorite, as you know, the quick fire. So I'm going to say a short statement. You hit me with your thoughts. Sound good? Sounds good. Okay, so you've listened to the show before. What's the favorite book and why? Favorite book and why? Why should white guys have all the fun? Because Reginald F. Lewis being a black man from Baltimore who created a private equity firm and was a billionaire is somebody who I look up to and respect. And just last, earlier this week, I got to speak at the Harvard Club where he was a member. And it was like a full circle moment to be in the same hallways that he walked and where he celebrated his wins. And even more cooler than that was afterwards, I tweeted about it and his daughter posted about it on Instagram which is like kind of surreal for me. So why should white guys have all the fun? Because Reginald F. Lewis was a pioneer. I love that. Um, Tell me, when shit hits the fan, how do you deal with it? When shit hits the fan, I call up my friends, tell them we should go to Buffalo Wild Wings and go have a drink and have a beer or two and some spicy hot wings, talk to my friends, vent about it, go back and answer some emails. I think it's a lot cheaper than my therapist. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, he then tells me I'm fucked up, and I'm like, yeah, I just paid you $200 to tell me I'm fucked up. Nice, man. Um, tell me, uh, what's the hardest element of your role with Rare Breed today? The hardest element of my role in Rare Breed today is figuring out how to be present for my family. This job is so all-consuming. Um, and once you decide you're going to start a firm, you're basically making a 20-year commitment, right? Fund one's 10 years. Two, three years later, you're going to raise fund two. That's another 10 years. Two to three years after that, you're going to raise fund three. You're now 17 years in that you're dedicated. And it's a hard job. It takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. And so it makes it hard to be present at home when you have a family, you have a significant other, when you have children. And so trying to be, a, trying to make sure I give them the highest quality of time because I know I can't give them the quantity of time. That's been a struggle. What would you most like to change about the world of venture? There's many things, I'm sure, but what would you most? I would love to change the world of venture in the way that I would love for venture to be more diverse and also to be more giving and more. I want venture to be more diverse on the LP side, the GP side, all the way through. And I would love for Venture to give founders, especially first-time founders and diverse founders, more grace for not knowing every little thing about this industry. Like if a founder gives you an NDA, don't go crazy on them. Don't end the meeting. Use it as a teachable moment to explain to them like 
why we don't do that. So many VCs don't take just the simplest five minutes to explain why they don't sign NDAs. Like things like that. I, I wish we would be we would be more thoughtful about being people. I, I listen. I, I totally agree. I remember as a like fifteen year old founder sending NDAs, <laughs> so I'm totally with you. Uh, penultimate one: you can have a billboard anywhere in the world, and it can say anything on it. What do you want on that billboard, and where is it? It's probably in New York City somewhere because that's where most people are going to see it, and it's going to say, "Wear a mask, get vaccinated, let's all do this together." Because I miss going to bars and clubs and happy hours and everything else I love to do with my friends and family. So let's all work together so we can get back to a normal. I'm tired of saying new normal. I just want to go back to normal. Yeah, no, I'm totally with you. And uh, you should come to London. We're totally partying it up here. Seriously, restaurants, everything. It's great. I'm more than happy to show you around. But I do want one final one. And it's, as you know, what's the most recent publicly announced investment? And why did you say yes and get so excited? Most recently publicly announced investment was an investment in a company called Unspun out of Oakland. Um, if you go to their website, it shows that they make custom jeans. You, they have an app that scans your body, you get jeans that are made to fit. And what they're actually building is in the background is they have um, a hardware component that takes the information from the app of your sizing and basically 3D prints your clothes. Um, and one piece with zero waste. And... When I first met the founders, they were just incredible people um, who were truly passionate about this. And they were building a tool that could revolutionize manufacturing all across the globe. And then they had a letter of support from like the head of design from Levi saying, my job is to figure out how to make the best jeans and they do better than me. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm in. Like, oh, that, that works for me. Right. It's, it's a combination of the amazing people, the ambitious goal, and then the support they had behind them. And I should also say that that company was sourced by my venture partner, Jonathan Kroll. Shout out, Jonathan. You know, he was truly bullish on this company and wanted to get it done. And so we were going to do it regardless because, you know, if somebody on my team truly believes that strongly, then I believe in conviction. Like if you have that strong enough conviction, I'll ride with you every time. But he was right. He was so right. They're such a great team. Listen, Mac, as, as I said, I, I've loved your Twitter for a while now. I'm so pleased that we connected over Twitter. I'm so pleased that we got to see this show. So thank you so much for joining me today. And this has been a lot of fun. Thank you for having me, Harry. I really appreciate it. Again, like, I can't believe I'm here. I'm on the show. Like, mama, I made it. I'm on 20 Minute VC. <laughs> <laughs>